Good morning, everyone. Uh, we've just hit 11 o'clock, so we're going to start the briefing while a few more people are just logging on. Uh, my name's Alfred and I'm from Principal IR and I'll be hosting today's FY21 results briefing. Um, today we're joined by Novartis CEO Peter Cook, who will provide a brief presentation on the FY21 results uh, and then open the floor to questions from investors and analysts. Um, through the presentation, if you do have any questions, please type them into your Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen if you're on a computer or uh, down the bottom if you're on a smart device and we'll read them out at the end of the presentation. Uh, as many of you will be aware, uh, Novartis has reported a big jump in annual revenue, so I won't take up any more of Peter's time. So Peter, I'll hand over to you. Okay, uh, uh, thanks very much, Alfred, and good morning all. Um, and uh, it, it is uh, a great day for us to be presenting our um, FY21 results. Uh, we're very excited. It's It's been uh, a year of great uh, growth, and and we think we've uh, hit hit the the targets that we set 12 months ago. And and when I get to Outlook, you'll sort of get a feel for our uh, targets for this year as well. Um, so just the the normal sort of disclaimer, and then moving on. W what is our philosophy or vision? We want to enable businesses to pay and be paid. And, and that really, our customer base, when we talk about businesses, is other fintechs, banks, financial services companies, and it's, it's merchants or small to medium businesses, even large enterprises. So uh, other business organisations, both inside and outside of the financial world. In, in looking at our business, and we, we've sort of gone through this before in some of our other webinars, but we see ourselves as a multi-services payment service provider and very specifically offering a range of payment services rather than just one payment service so that in the longer term we will be a very major provider of payment uh, facilities and services in Australia and overseas for, for our um, business customers. And that goes across the, the main areas of payments, what's called issuing, acquiring, uh, processing, which is cross-border payments and other sort of settlement services, uh, billing services around subscription billing in particular, and automation of payment services, and then uh, of course bringing bringing forth the the bank license that we're applying for in Australia. So, but by providing multiple services, we hope to be able to uh, over time for our customers, uh, where possible, provide more than one service to them. And, and increase our share of the wallet of the the wallet of our customers. And and in terms of our industry, there there is massive structural change. We we are seeing um, digital transformation in all industries, but in particular in financial services. COVID has of course driven that uh, or ex accelerated the change from cash to cashless. But right across the different elements of our business, there there are. Uh, all sorts of statistics and, and um, proof points about the growth in the markets we're in. And we're in very, very large markets for every part of what we do, and they're all growing. So we think we're facing into the right markets. We've got digital transformation uh, of financial services as a, um, a tailwind that really follows and supports our activities. And you know, if, if you look at it from, from a shareholder or investor's point of view, we hope to be able to, to use the funds from our shareholders and investors to give them an accelerated return by the work we do into these markets. Un underlying everything we do is, is a, a strategy about building on licenses. So we, we're very focused on, on gaining additional uh, licenses, whether it be in Australia or overseas. Uh, licenses are really your ticket to play. And um, it, it's sort of at, at its simplest level, just as you can't get electrical work done in your house without getting a licensed electrician in the markets we play in, we need to be licensed for what we do. Um, we've got a range of licenses in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, Europe. We're applying for additional licenses in Europe and Singapore right now. Uh, and, and we're uh, applying for a bank license in Australia as well. But on top of licenses, we add technology and we've got uh, a number of technology platforms that, that uh, specialize, essentially give us um, capability to, to use those licenses and create value. And, and then uh, really where the super commercial value comes is that uh, 
we can link up with um, other partners in the fintech and, and uh, payments world. Uh, and in particular, as we've listed there, quite a number of uh, very uh, serious tier one partners, whether it be Visa, UnionPay, Alipay, um, Marketa, Ripple and others. We've been able to use our, our governance as a listed company, as a licensed company, uh, our revenues and financial position to be, to be able to get in a position to be able to get um, proper licenses with, with these sorts of, or commercial arrangements with these uh, sorts of companies. We've got some logos down the bottom of some of our enterprise customers. And, and again, uh, servicing cu customers such as Telstra or Cathay Pacific, uh, it, it really is an indication of the, the quality of our technology and platforms that we can continue to, to work with tier one customers such as that. Just looking back on the, on, on the year, uh, we really think we've, we've hit a lot of goals. Um, we, we've uh, a serious number of achievements, whether it be additional partnerships, um, the, the work with Visa and Apple Pay, uh, Visa and uh, Afterpay to be able to launch in New Zealand, uh, the, the Afterpay service. Um, in, in a very difficult recruitment environment, we've been able to grow our team. And in fact, we're still trying to, to grow our team and, and really have a a very serious payments company, as I've said before. Uh, we've been able to launch our acquiring business and you know we're pressing on for our full acquiring licenses. Uh, working with Ripple, we've been able to bring on uh, the Philippines and are working on a number of other markets with, with Ripple. Uh, Immersion, which has continued to grow, we've launched in the US and, and that's just a, a power of work unto itself and gives us a long-term um, uh, growth market there. And, and then uh, on the bank, we've been able to, uh, notwithstanding the, the slowdown from the regulator, we've been able to uh, bring through significant funding, progress our application and, and are still pushing on with that. Looking at our, our financial results, uh, the, the measure we, we've been primarily leading with is around revenue uh, and in particular on sales revenue. Uh, we were uh, $16.4 million today, uh, sorry, last financial year. Uh, that was up about 50% on the year before and really continues that sort of trend of 50% year on year uh, growth. And then uh, inside the business, uh, what we call our processing sales revenue, 73% uh, growth uh, year on year. And, and, you know, we're absolutely trying to accelerate that at the moment. Just on sales revenue, $16.4 million. But actually, if you look at what we call our total revenue, which includes R&D and uh, government grants, we're up at $18.4 million from $11.9 million the year before. And again, a circa 50% increase. So we've been able to drive all the, the revenue lines of our business at, at a very considerable clip. And, and then within the year, um, tends to be a little bit that the first quarter uh, is is a bit flat. Um, but actually, we've pretty much been able to drive quarter on quarter revenue growth. Um, and and, uh, and wh whether one quarter tends to be cyclical or not, but really focused on just driving that very consistent growth across a year and then across the years. And uh, we, we uh, this point, expect that that momentum will continue into this financial year. Just in terms of looking at our um, uh, P&L uh, revenue, sales revenue of $16.48 million, other income of 1.9, gives us total revenue of about 18.4. Um, the uh, statutory loss of, of $11 million plus or minus, and then within that, uh, the, the figure that we really focus on of um, uh, what we would call our, our operating EBITDA or our normalised EBITDA is minus uh, $4.3 million, prior year about um, minus $3.5 million. And, and so really uh, at, at that level of, of expenditure, we've been able to drive this very significant growth of 50% plus. Uh, our focus for this year, very sort of similar to to be able to drive that that revenue growth 
and um, and meanwhile live within our balance sheet, uh, invest our, our shareholders' funds to to give us that growth. Maybe is sort of an indicator of growth and and really happening right now across across our business and and uh, and and our sort of hiring is is that we are really looking to. Uh, extend our business. It's it's a difficult environment right now with borders closed and whatever in Australia to pick up staff. Um, but we, we've been able to to uh, actually hire some really really good people over the last six months, uh, and we are continuing to do so. So we see that the, um, this year is another year of of driving growth in our people and infrastructure and licences. But notwithstanding all of that, to continue this this uh, focus on on revenue growth and becoming a much larger business. And so, looking forward, um, and you're sort of hearing the message from me. Very much the the strategic focus is growing top line revenue, gaining market share, moving our, ourselves to to a point where um, we will become a, a profitable business once once we hit that level of scale. Um, we've just completed a, a very significant capital raising, which which has allowed us to drive into new um, markets and also increase our presence in existing markets and and really um, e extend our our ability to diversify and increase our sales. Uh, we are looking at a number of uh, M and A opportunities. Um, we we did invest uh, very significantly in um, uh, Reckon Limited. And we have meaningful conversations with Reckon uh, as to to working together on on a range of opportunities with them, and, and we think that 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 has a very good um, that's a very good opportunity for the for the shareholders of Novati. We're working through in terms of licences on our Visa and Mastercard acquiring licences, which uh, we, we at this stage see as imminent. Uh, we continue to work on our our um, banking license in Australia, and we we uh, see that that. Um, will hopefully occur over the next few months. We are working on licenses in, as I said, Singapore and Europe, and um, and see that those licenses should also become available to us in a reasonable time frame. So, core strategy: um, uh, flesh out our business, grow revenue, and drive ourselves towards that uh, profitability point. Um, uh, and with that, uh, Alfred, that's uh, very much my presentation. Happy to take questions for today. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Peter. Uh, congratulations on the great result. Um, we have actually had quite a, quite a few questions come in already. If anyone does yeah. have any, um, just add them to the Q&A box on your left-hand side of the screen or bottom if you're on a smart device, um, but I'll start reading them out. Peter, the first one comes from Christian. Uh, Hi, Peter. Excellent results. Uh, excellent growth for the team. Uh, have you got a revenue forecast for immersion coming into FY22 and beyond? Um, so, Christian, we're, we're not in, in a sense, we're not uh, a forecasting company quite to, to that level and, and in particular by segment. Um, but I think, you know, I'd say in an aspiration sense, we, we at least want to continue the growth rate for the the whole company that we've been able to show over the last three or four years, and and in terms of immersion, really we're we're um, fastidiously trying to grow the business uh, at a very strong level, both in Australia and the US, and and I think for the longer term, thinking about what further markets to to take immersion into, but right at the moment to to manage the two markets we've got. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I've got a question on the banking license from Harold and Wade that I'm going to merge into one. Uh, RE, the banking license, will Novartis be seeking to provide banking services to select segments such as small businesses? Um, if so, please comment how this will be used. Um, and Wade adds, uh, who will you guys be targeting for the banking services? Uh, uh, hello, Wade. Um, the the all of the work we've done on the bank and really the the, the core business plan is is around um, uh, what we will call migrant services banking and cross border banking services. That that it, they are the primary uh, let's call it one market or two markets maybe, and and also we see that the, there is a significant demand for banking to other financial services type companies, and then you, you might say finally, but not as our core market 
is is banking of small businesses in in Australia. But in terms of us getting our own sort of blue ocean and you know uh, trying to be uh, different uh, and and appeal to uh, essentially a less congested market, we we have primarily focused on the cross border banking and payment services. We see ourselves as providing a lot of that borderless banking. And we see that that's an area that the the other major banks in Australia uh, are less focused on. So we see that the market we're creating for ourselves is newer and you know more of a blue ocean cleaner um, market market segment. And actually, slightly related to that is that if if you look at Novati, we are a payments company. A lot of the customers we we seek to address. Not only will they need lending type, you know, deposit and lending services, they need um, payment services. So it's sort of really playing to our strong suit. Thanks, Peter. Uh, question from Glenn regarding the acquiring license for Visa and MasterCard, uh, the yeah. bank license approval. Can you give us a feel for the short term effects of the approvals, i.e., what is the ramp up of both? Hello, Glenn. Um, so, so essentially, the acquiring licenses. Uh, allow us to um, be, let's call it, deeper embedded and closer to Visa and MasterCard as the schemes. And so you could take a view that, well, definitely, that, that we'll have deeper margins to play with. So, so if we, you know, figuratively, if we charged, say, 1.5% to take a Visa or MasterCard tra transaction, uh, rather than paying away maybe 1.1% or 1% out of the 1.5%, uh, we might be only paying away 0.6% as an example. So uh, it allows us to get deeper margins and it also, having the acquiring licences, also allows us to more act as a wholesale participant and offer services to other fintech companies. So net-net, deeper margins. Peter, is there any effect on Afterpay as a customer of Novati with the acquisition from Square? Um, so, not that we know of, um, and, and in fact, possibly. Uh, so, so certainly in terms of the work we do in New Zealand, no, and and potentially might uh, accelerate the, the growth of Afterpay there. But uh, uh, what what we would hope is that. Uh, Afterpay is looking at additional markets and we, we might be able to help them uh, with their issuing services in additional markets. And, and I think we're seeing that the, the primary uh, method to market for, for the buy now pay laters is through an issuing led product rather than uh, as they first launched an acquiring led product into merchants. So we, we would hope that uh, if over time we can extend our issuing licenses into other countries that we could support uh, Afterpay or others in those markets. Thanks, Peter. Speaking of other markets, Wade's asking, would you guys tap into India regarding the processing payments? Uh, uh, Wade, um, in, in terms of India, we, we, we are looking at one service at the moment, which we've been trialling, but at the moment it's you know pre-revenue and approval concept. I, th I think for us, you know, markets such as China or India, the, the very large markets, um, we, you know, one, you, you only want to deal with licensed players there. And then two, you need a very strong commercial relationship and, and, a, uh, and I guess a meaningful service to, to go in there. So we, you know, in terms of India and, and China in particular, and I'll sort of use them as parallel large markets, um, our general market entree is to uh, try and, talk to large licensed players there and then work out a meaningful service that our customers uh, or maybe even their customers want in Australia or vice versa. So that, that's how we think about those rather than Novartis per, per se just going and I don't know, opening up in India. We, we're sort of more working to open up with other meaningful banks or financial services players there. Thanks, Peter. Question from Robert. Uh, exciting disruption in the payment sector. Is this likely to continue post-COVID? Um, Robert, I mean, we think that we are, we are on the end of a, or not on the end of, in the middle of a multi-year sort of tailwind. Um, and, you know, I, I sort of use that expression, digital transformation in, in financial services. But 
that the, there is just ongoing um, uh, demand for news. So, so interestingly, conversion of let's say older services to a more digital world and and new services, um, and a lot of whereas you know you could say twenty years ago any payment type service one went to their bank. Now that's not the case. And you know the banks are using payments companies such as us to deliver services, or fintechs such as us are working with other fintechs, and and you know there is just new demand for services. So um, no, we we just see it as a multi-year tailwind. Thanks, Peter. Uh, question from Lincoln regarding crypto. Hi, Peter. With the rapid demand from institutions and corporates into cryptocurrencies. Are you able to share Novartis' inbound interest into this area? And Christian follows that on. From your opinion, how big do you see the uptake becoming? Um, so uh, thanks, Lincoln, Christian. Um, uh, look, first of all, it, it would we are um, uh, we are primarily a payments company. So I'll say that whether the payments being crypto or it's you know, on a card or, or it's a cross-border remittance payment or whatever, as long as we can get ourselves as a participant in the flow, then then we have a chance to make fees. So I, I, the, the way that I uh, would generically see uh, the world of crypto or, you know, pay, you know, let's call it digital assets, is that it's here to stay and notwithstanding whether, whether you know, there are some... Um, you know, cryptocurrencies that blow up or whatever. But if you look at it net net, that it is a growing asset class, it is still relatively a very small asset class, and it is still relatively very small for day-to-day uh, -day payments of businesses in Australia and overseas. But as long as we're positioned to be able to accept or, um, you know, make payments through that and get a fee, then we just see it as all positive. Um, I think, so. you know, we are, we've, done this um, patent application for crypto payment gateway. Uh, once we can get that deployed onto merchants, then they can um, accept payments on crypto. We're also, we've got clients such as CryptoSpend who are using our issuing cards for uh, doing payout type transactions. And we're also using Ripple. Um, you could, you know, their, their crypto um, based network for making payments. So I think you, you you would say that Novartis' positioning here is that we're not a, a deep we're not a deep principal in 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 as a crypto player, but we want to uh, be able to make fees from all sorts of um, flows of funds using crypto or digital assets. Thanks, Peter. Sorry, are you able to comment on the inbound interest you're receiving in the area? Um, yeah. So it's uh, I if that was Lincoln or Christian, it's it's sort of extreme. Um, if, if we do uh, any sort of announcement where, where we mention, you know, as an example, Ripple or, um, uh, you know, you know, crypto payments, yes, we, we do get inbound interest. Uh, and, and sorry, I misread that question. I'm more focused on, I'll call it revenue. So we just see it that um, uh, we, we want to work into that so that we can drive revenues. But yes, there is a lot of interest there if I've answered Thanks. the right question. Yep, no, got it there. Thanks, Peter. Um, all right, everyone, we've got about five more questions and we are going to have to wrap this up in about five minutes. So I'll get through these. If you do have any more, please type them in. Um, Glenn is asking, clearly hired a lot of people in FY21, jumping from 65 to 128. Where can we expect this number to be in FY22? Um, uh, uh, I haven't got the, the exact number. I think it's about 140 something that that we've got in our budget, uh, and it's a to some extent it's a little bit revenue dependent as well. So we have a a budget of and, and an idea of how we want our organisation chart to continue to flesh out, uh, but we're sort of monitoring it internally. We're running a process of every three months, sort of looking at our our revenues and then in a slightly agile way, uh, hiring following revenues. So that's uh, really the internal discipline, but but the company will be slightly larger than it is now. Now, on assuming the bank license comes through, if the bank license comes through, it will separately uh, hire 
uh, some 40 to 50 staff uh, in the following sort of six to 12 months after the license. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I've got two questions from Gary. Uh, well done on the progress. How much was revenue from China payments affected by the Australian border closure? And can you give us any further breakdown on revenue sources? Uh, Gary, interestingly on China payments, so the, as you can imagine, in-store payments, so if you were a Chinese citizen using Alipay to go to a tourist venue or a hotel or whatever, that, that's been smashed. Uh, and we would have thought that there would have been very significant drop off in tuition payments and one thing or another. In fact, we've seen very, very strong growth in, because we're mainly uh, exposed to the online payments, I guess, for the Chinese wallets, we've seen very, very strong growth. And I think there's a few sort of dynamics happening. One is that there's uh, a number of people stuck in China who own properties here, they've got to pay rates, they've got to pay utilities, they're paying university fees, whatever. So so actually we're providing a great service for them. And then, you know, you st we've still got many, many Chinese citizens here who are essentially pulling funds out of their, their Chinese accounts to pay for bills here. So so uh, in terms of the, the Chinese payments, we, we've had massive growth uh, over the 12 months. Sorry, it was the second part of the question. Uh, what was that? Um, uh, can you provide any further breakdown on the revenue sources? Um, so, so there is, uh, in our annual report, we've gone to a level of segmentation that is additional to what we've done before, Gary. And so, um, yeah, we are trying to segment against issuing, acquiring, um, uh, cross-border payments, immersion and so forth, uh, bill subscription. Yep. So, so there, there is more segmentation in our accounts. Peter. I've uh, just got two more questions here. Uh, Glenn is asking, have you had many discussions with Reckon? Are there tangible synergies over the next year? Will you potentially take a board seat on Reckon? Is this the same Glenn that's asked two other questions? You've uh, you've done well. Um, uh, hey, Glenn. Um, so so there, there are definitely meaningful, um, um, you know, uh, revenue sort of outcomes that can be achieved. So, you know, the simple thing is, is that if, if you're a, 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 a business accounting customer of Reckon, then potentially our payment services could, could also be an offering to, to that business. So, so we see that there, there is um, definitely an increase of services that can be applied to the Reckon customer base. So, so you, could, you could call it an addressable market. Um, in terms of a board seat and so forth, uh, um, not really at this stage, actually, no. Thanks, Peter. Just one last question here from Paul. Where are you at with acquisitions? Uh, hello, Paul. It, it's essentially um, a forever uh, task. So it is an absolute part of our strategy that we grow by uh, M&A or, or in organic growth. Uh, and we, we've got um, uh, companies that are helping us there. So, you know, we've actually um, got some companies that work on a buy side mandate for us. So we, we are assiduously looking for uh, opportunities. They seem to, you know, it's just like any sales funnel. You've got to get them in the funnel, work through. Um, we've failed a couple on due diligence. We've failed a couple on price. Some have failed us on price. Uh, and so it's just an ongoing task. Excellent. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, that's all the questions we've had for this morning and just on 11.30, so great timing. Uh, Peter, on behalf of all the attendees, thank you very much for your presentation and taking the time to answer investor questions. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you again in the future. Oh, Alfred, thank you. And, and look, I do really appreciate um, our shareholders and investors that have dialled in. I mean, we, we want to communicate with you. We, we are very proud of what we've been doing and what we are doing. And, uh, you know, uh, please reach out to, to myself or my other staff. And, um, uh, yep, yeah, thank you very much for being involved. Better.